Oh, in this uh, and probably in this lecture and in the next lecture, uh, we will uh, discuss the air standard auto cycle, which is actually an idealization of the sequence of uh, processes uh, that are executed in a spark ignition engine. Okay. So, let us start with uh, uh, this uh, cutaway view of a Mazda sky active engine. So, this is a Mazda sky active G engine, uh, which is actually a very interesting engine. We will talk a little bit more about this engine uh, or at least the uh, interesting aspects of this engine uh, later on. Uh, but for now, you can see that you know it is a four cylinder engine. So, here we, we see one piston, here we see a cylinder and another piston, one more cylinder and a piston and you can also see uh, one more cylinder and a piston here. And um, the uh, valves, uh, the intake and the exhaust valves are uh, visible here. The camshaft is also visible here. So, that is the uh, camshaft. Uh, so, connecting rod and uh, this is the crankshaft. So, uh, basically this is a uh, gasoline engine and um, it executes the following sequence of processes. Uh, air and uh, fuel as I said gasoline vapor or taken into the engine. So, the fuel has to be in vapor form when it is taken uh, into the engine. So, we are now focusing on one cylinder, isolating one cylinder and looking at the sequence of processes that are executed in that cylinder. Okay. So, this is done during the so called intake stroke. Okay. Now, in the next stroke uh, which is the compression stroke. So, uh, stroke here uh, refers to uh, a travel of the piston from uh, either bottom to the uh, top or top to bottom. Okay. So, basically as you can see uh, from this picture, this is a reciprocating engine. So, the piston travels up and down. So, at the bottom most location uh, of the piston is called the bottom dead center because the velocity of the piston there is 0. And then the piston begins to move up. So, the uh, topmost location of the piston is called the top dead center. Okay. So, one stroke would correspond to a movement of the piston from either top dead center to bottom dead center or bottom dead center to top dead center. So, during the intake stroke air and uh, fuel vapor are taken into the engine and at the next stroke which is the compression stroke this mixture is compressed. Okay. Now, towards the end of the uh, compression stroke and before the beginning of the next stroke, uh, the compressed mixture is ignited using a spark plug, hence the name spark ignition uh, combustion engine. So, the mixture is ignited using a spark plug and the uh, combustion front uh, travels outward from the spark plug and then into the mixture and it then pushes the piston down. Okay. That is the next stroke which is called the power stroke. Okay. So, here the combustion products. So, as the uh, combustion wave travels outward from the spark plug, it consumes or combusts the fuel and air mixture in its path and the gases then expand okay, and uh, generate power. Okay. So, this is the next stroke. And in the exhaust stroke, the piston moves from bottom dead center to top dead center and pushes the exhaust gases outside the cylinder. So, that the engine is then ready to receive the next or fresh mixture of air and fuel vapor. <coughs> so, intake in the intake stroke, the uh, piston travels from the top dead center to the bottom dead center. Let me denote it like this. Now, in the compression stroke, it travels from the bottom dead center to the top dead center. Then the combustion stroke essentially occurs at constant volume, which means that uh, there is very little movement of the piston during the uh, combustion process. So, that is not uh, really a stroke, but it is actually a process in between the compression stroke and the power stroke. Okay. So, during the power stroke, the gases push the piston downwards and generate power and during the exhaust stroke, the piston moves upwards and uh, expels the exhaust gases from the cylinder so that a fresh mixture of air and fuel vapor can be inducted into the engine. Okay, so, as you can see here, uh, this is the first stroke, this is the second stroke, this is the third stroke and this is the fourth stroke. So, the entire sequence is executed in four strokes okay, and uh, hence such an engine is called a four stroke engine. Now, we may represent the um, uh, processes undergone by the uh, air fuel mixture on a uh, PV diagram like this. 
So, notice that the uh, volume is bounded by the top dead center and the bottom dead center. So, the red chain line here uh, denotes the actual the processes undergone in the actual SI engine. So, we start with the intake stroke and as you can see the piston moves from top dead center to bottom dead center where uh, air is uh, air and fuel vapor is taken in. It is then compressed as you can see here in the compression stroke park then uh, ignites the combustion mixture. So, that is essentially at constant volume. So, the entire mixture ignites and burns and the burning mixture then pushes the piston down like this. And then in the exhaust stroke, uh, the exhaust valve opens and the gases are then pushed outside and uh, the uh, process is completed. Now, the cylinder is ready to receive a fresh mixture. Now, it may appear as though the process is a cyclic process, but in reality it is not because we take in a fresh uh, mixture of air and fuel vapor in the intake stroke. It executes a sequence of processes and then at the end during the exhaust stroke, the combustion gases are sent out and a fresh mixture is taken in. Although at the same thermodynamic state, but the uh, process executed in the engine is not a cyclic process that is uh, very important to bear in mind. So, as the um, um, as the strokes are executed, the valves that are seen here are opened and closed appropriately. For example, during the intake stroke, the intake valve is open, but the exhaust valves are closed. There may be uh, more than uh, one intake and one exhaust valve. Typically, these are four valve engines, which means they have two intake valves and two exhaust valves. Okay? So, the camshaft uh, ensures the, that the spring loaded valve, so you can see the uh, you can actually see the spring here. So, you can see the spring here. So, the uh, camshaft ensures that the uh, spring loaded valves are in the appropriate open or closed position as the processes take place. Now, uh, although the, uh, the sequence of processes appears to be cyclic on the PV diagram, the working substance does not execute a cyclic process. Okay? That is very important to keep in mind. Now, in the equivalent air standard auto cycle, we assume that there is a fixed mass of uh, air in uh, each cylinder. Okay? There is a fixed mass of air in each cylinder and it executes a cyclic process. So, that is the idealization that we will make when uh, developing the air standard auto cycle. Okay? So, we assume that there is a fixed mass of air m which executes a cyclic process because the air inside the uh, cylinder is fixed. We need not take in fresh air at the end of every uh, at the I mean during the intake stroke or uh, send any uh, combustion products out because it is uh, clean air which means that the intake and the exhaust strokes are absent. So, the air standard auto cycle actually is a two stroke cyclic process whereas the actual sequence of processes in an SI engine is a four stroke process as illustrated here. Okay? So, we have illustrated a four stroke engine here. So, that executes a, uh, I am sorry, that executes four strokes. Whereas, the equivalent uh, idealized air centered auto cycle executes only two strokes. Okay? Heat addition and heat rejection during the air centered cycle are assumed to take place at constant volume. <coughs> And this is illustrated in blue in this uh, in this diagram. <clears throat> so the air starts uh, the cyclic process from state one. So it is uh, compressed uh, from state one to state two. In the ideal case, we assume this compression process to be isentropic. Okay? Heat addition occurs at constant volume between state two and state three. Uh, power stroke or expansion occurs between state three and state four. And then uh, heat rejection at constant volume takes place between uh, state 4 and state 1 and the cycle is repeated. So, notice that in going from state 1 to state 2, the piston moves from the bottom dead center to the top dead center and then in going from state uh, 3 to state 4, the piston moves from top dead center to bottom dead center. Okay? So, there is only two strokes. Now, if you um, uh, go back to this actual uh, engine uh, that we have shown here, remember we uh, fixed our attention on one cylinder and then we uh, actually uh, said that 
the four processes or four strokes are executed in uh, one cylinder. Okay. The question of why have more than one cylinder then logically arises in the actual engine. Okay. This is required because as we discussed power is produced only during one out of the four strokes in an actual engine which means that the power generated is intermittent, it is not continuous. Unlike the case of a gas turbine engine which executed a Brayton cycle, uh, the power produced there is continuous. Whereas here the power produced is intermittent. So, to minimize the intermittency in the output power, we add more cylinders. Okay? So, we add as you can see here three more cylinders. So, when we have four cylinders, generally what is ensured is that at least one cylinder will always be executing a power stroke. So, that the power production appears to be uh, continuous and not intermittent. So, at any given time, one of the cylinders is guaranteed to be executing a power stroke. So, the cylinder firing is sequenced or the firing of the spark plug is sequenced in such a way that one at least one cylinder will be producing power uh, at any given point in time. So, by having more cylinders, not only are we producing more power, we are also uh, reducing the intermittency in the power, power generation. Okay? Because in the auto cycle, we focus on one uh, cylinder only, multi cylinders extending this to multi cylinders is trivial. So, we need not discuss that here. So, we are focusing only on one cylinder and looking at this cyclic process. Okay, now, <coughs> since, um, uh, <coughs> since a fixed quantity of uh, air executes a cyclic process in each cylinder, unlike in the case of an air standard Brayton cycle, uh, the processes here are not steady flow processes. Okay, these are actually non-flow processes. We have a fixed quantity of air in each cylinder and it executes the uh, processes that we described, compression, heat addition, expansion and then uh, heat rejection. So, we cannot use steady flow energy equation. We uh, use the non-flow uh, form of first law. So, delta u uh, is given as uh, for process 1, 2, delta u is q minus w because it is an isentropic compression process. Process 1, 2 is uh, in, the, uh, in the ideal case, it is an isentropic compression process. So, q is 0 and delta u is simply uh, w 1 2. So, w 1 2 during the cycle is m times u 2 minus u 1. Just like what we did for uh, the Brayton cycle, without any loss of generality, we will assume the isentropic efficiency of uh, relevant uh, work absorbing or work producing processes to be 100 percent. Um, if uh, the case when the isentropic efficiency is less than 100 percent can be handled without any difficulty in the framework that we are going to develop. Okay? Now, Q23 is uh, heat addition at constant volume and this is equal to M times U3 minus U2. And just like uh, what we did for uh, process 1, 2, the uh, work interaction doing, during process 3, 4 is actually M times U3 minus U4. And heat rejection at constant volume uh, takes place uh, during process 4, 1 and we may write the heat rejected to be equal to M times U4 minus U1. Now, the net work produced during the cycle uh, is the uh, work that is developed during the uh, power stroke minus the work that is absorbed during the compression stroke. So, that the thermal efficiency of the cycle may be written like this 1 minus u4 minus u1 over u3 minus u2. Now, if you assume the working uh, substance, which in this case is air, to be calorically perfect, such a, um, an analysis is called the cold air standard analysis because we assume it to be calorically perfect, then we may rewrite uh, these expressions uh, before both for uh, the efficiency as well as the uh, net work that is produced. Okay? This may be uh, re rewritten by uh, using the fact that u is equal to Cv times T. So, we may rewrite uh, the specific power, expression for specific power like this and the expression for efficiency like this. Here, the quantity R is called the compression ratio and it is the ratio V1 over V2. Notice that 
uh, v1 over v2 is equal to v4 over v3. Because <coughs> 2, 3 and 4, 1 are constant volume processes. Okay. So, this v1 over v2 is called the uh, compression ratio. Uh, in the case of the Brayton cycle, we had uh, a parameter called the pressure ratio, which was the ratio of pressures at the end of the compression process or expansion process appropriately. Here, we are actually utilizing volume. Okay. So, it is the volume uh, at the beginning of compression to the volume at the end of compression and that is called the uh, compression uh, ratio. So, you can see that the cold air standard analysis brings out the fact that there are two parameters in the cycle. One is T3 over T1 and the other one is R, which is the compression ratio. Okay. Now, notice that V2 is called the uh, V2 is called the clearance volume. So, this is V2. So, when we have a, a, a cylinder like this, So, this would be the BDC and this could be the TDC. Notice that the piston for obvious reasons does not run all the way up to the top of the cylinder. So, it uh, stops at some location here called the TDC. So, this volume which is V2 in this figure is called the clearance volume and the distance between the or the volume between the TDC and the BDC is called the uh, swept volume or stroke volume. So, V2 is called the clearance volume and V1 minus V2 is called the displacement or the swept volume. So, when someone says that uh, the engine has a displacement of 1 liter, let us say it is a, a 4 cylinder engine and it is st uh, stated that the engine has a displacement of 1 liter, that means that the displacement of each cylinder is 250 cc. So, uh, both the uh, efficiency and the specific work uh, are plotted here against compression ratio. Notice that just like uh, what we did for the Braden cycle, the performance metrics of uh, um, the uh, auto cycle are also specific power efficiency, first law efficiency and second law efficiency. Okay? So, you can see uh, that the, uh, the efficiency of the auto cycle depends only on the compression ratio and it increases and uh, sort of tapers off after a compression ratio of about 10. Okay? We have not really plotted efficiency beyond uh, a compression ratio of 10 either for the specific power or for the efficiency because uh, spark ignition engines typically do not operate at a ratio higher than 10. Okay. Now, why not? The question that arises next is why not? Because in an actual engine, uh, what is compressed as you can, uh, as we mentioned earlier, what is compressed is a mixture of air and fuel vapor or gasoline vapor. Okay. So, um, in this engine, uh, if you try to compress the air and fuel vapor beyond a compression ratio of let us say 10 or so, what would happen is at the end of the compression stroke, uh, the temperature would be higher because the air and fuel vapor are being compressed. And it is quite possible that at some spots in the engine, the temperature of the mixture can be uh, can go above the auto ignition temperature of the mixture, in which case the mixture will self ignite even before the spark, uh, uh, you know, the, even before uh, the spark is uh, given in the engine. Okay, or just as the spark is given in the engine. Now, the uh, entire uh, the power stroke relies on the fact that the location of the spark is uh, spark plug is such that when the spark is initiated, it initiates a combustion wave which then travels outward from the spark plug towards the piston. Okay, and it has to be done in a in a very very specific manner. It cannot be done too early because if it is done too early, then uh, if the uh, mixture is ignited as the piston is still moving up, then the downcoming combustion wave will tend to push the piston down during the compression stroke itself, which is detrimental to the engine as well as the process that we are trying to execute. Now, if it is ignited too late. 
That means that the piston would have started, uh, would, have, would already be on its downward stroke and the expanding gases will not be able to give enough of a kick to the piston to generate sufficient power. So, much of the uh, energy of combustion is wasted. Okay. So, it cannot be too early, it cannot be too late. So, it has to be done in such a way that the combustion wave, the expansion of the combustion wave coincides with the uh, downward movement of the piston. So, that maximum kick is delivered to the piston and it can generate the maximum amount of power. So, it is a very carefully controlled uh, sequence and if part of the mixture ignites early or just as the uh, at some other location, just as the spark plug is ignited, then the combustion wave from this uh, combustion uh, process would actually also travel outwards and it will oppose the combustion wave that is coming down from the mixture that is ignited by the spark plug and this can actually cause uh, unstable combustion inside the cylinder and unstable pressure variation inside the cylinder and the piston will not be uh, kicked smoothly down, it will start to oscillate because of differing pressure waves, combustion waves hitting the cylinder at different instants in time. So, the carefully controlled sequence is uh, destroyed and the engine then uh, the piston begins to vibrate and the entire engine then begins to vibrate and this process is called knocking. And this is due to auto ignition of the mixture in some parts in the cylinder away from the spark plug. Which is why the compression ratio of spark ignition engines are never taken beyond uh, 10. So, you can see that the efficiency of the auto cycle more or less begins to taper off at about uh, 60 percent around uh, a compression ratio of 10. And if you look at the uh, specific power for the auto cycle, notice that we have plotted uh, three curves here, each one corresponding to a particular value of T3 over T1. Okay. T1 is uh, typically as you can imagine, T1 is uh, typically uh, 300 Kelvin and peak temperatures uh, in uh, spark ignition engines, typical spark ignition engines are around uh, uh, 2100 uh, Kelvin or so. Okay. This may seem uh, higher than the temperatures that we saw for Brayton cycle, but you must bear in mind that the Brayton cycle as we already said executes uh, steady flow processes, which means that the temperature, peak temperature that we are seeing there is sustained peak temperature. Whereas, in the case of the auto cycle, the peak temperature is seen only for an instant because it is a non-flow process and then the gases begin to expand and the temperature of the mixture uh, decreases rapidly. Okay. So, the temperature at the instant of ignition can be as high as 2100 Kelvin but it begins to decrease uh, very rapidly afterwards. So, there is a big difference between the peak temperature in a Brayton cycle and the peak temperature in an auto and a diesel cycle which we will see next. Okay. So, this value of 7 is sort of uh, representative of actual spark ignition engines. And you can see that you know the specific power uh, pretty much asymptotes after a compression ratio of 4 irrespective of the uh, value for T3 over T1. The specific power increases with T3 over T1 as we can see from here, but for a given T3 over T1 uh, the uh, specific power uh, sort of asymptotes after a compression ratio of 4. For the um, uh, ideal uh, air centered auto cycle or the, uh, the cold uh, analysis of the auto cycle, uh, we can also uh, derive an expression for the uh, second law efficiency. Okay. So, uh, the uh, exergy supplied per unit mass uh, uh, during each cycle may be written like this. So, basically exergy is uh, supplied uh, during the compression stroke in the form of uh, work and uh, heat is supplied uh, in the heat addition constant volume uh, heat addition process. So, the uh, exergy supplied during the uh, uh, during process 1 2 may be written like this and the exergy supplied uh, uh, through the heat interaction may be written like this. Okay. Now, um, we may rearrange this expression in the following manner by pulling out uh, RT1 from this and then uh, we can actually simplify and write this expression uh, the dimensionless exergy supplied. Notice that this is exergy supplied per unit mass whereas this is the dimensionless exergy supplied made dim non-dimensional by using the quantity MCV T1. So, if we do this then 
the exergy supplied uh, involves the compression ratio and uh, T3 over T1. Uh, similarly, exergy recovered may be written like this. So, this is basically the uh, uh, power the work done during the power stroke. And this also may be simplified eventually to read like this, okay. The dimensionless exergy recovered uh, reads like this and again this involves the compression ratio R and the temperature ratio T3 over T1. So, now we are in a position to calculate the uh, second law efficiency, okay. Notice that we have taken uh, TH to be equal to T3. So, we have assumed the reservoir uh, to be at the highest temperature in the cycle when, uh, when uh, heat is supplied. Okay. So, uh, the variation of uh, second law efficiency for the auto cycle is shown here. Note that in contrast to the, uh, uh, the first law efficiency which involved only uh, the compression ratio and not T3 over T1, the expression for second law efficiency involves T3 over T1 also. So, it has been plotted here for uh, different values of uh, T3 over T1, representative values of T3 over T1 um, uh, same as um, yeah same as what we have used here for the auto cycle. So, these are representative values of T3 over T1 and you can see that um, the second law efficiency uh, generally increases with compression ratio. However, uh, it decreases with the T3 over T1. So, as the, as the maximum temperature in the cycle increases, the heat supplied or the reservoir temperature also increases. So, the, um, uh, the loss of exergy due to uh, heat supply across a finite temperature difference increases because this temperature difference keeps going up as the temperature of the reservoir uh, keeps increasing. So, as T3 over T1 goes up, you can see that the second law efficiency comes down. Which, um, uh, which makes sense. In fact, um, uh, later on when we discuss um, uh, diesel cycle, here also you can see that uh, as uh, one of the parameters goes up, the, uh, the important parameter goes up, the second law efficiency of the diesel cycle also behaves in a similar manner. But the important takeaway from here is that the, um, uh, the second law efficiency uh, is the highest corresponding to compression ratio about uh, 10 or so. So, it is a second law efficiency can be as high as uh, 75 to 80 percent which is quite good and it depends on both the compression ratio as well as the, the, uh, <coughs> the value for the parameter T3 over T1. So, these are the insights that we are able to get from the cold air standard analysis. Uh, cold implying that we have assumed air to be uh, calorically perfect as well. Let us go through a worked example uh, illustrating this. So, at the beginning of an ideal air centered auto cycle, air is at 100 kPa and 298 Kelvin, compression ratio is 9, peak temperature is 2200 Kelvin. We are asked to determine thermal efficiency, mean effective pressure, and the second law efficiency. So, we assume uh, the cycle to be ideal, it is uh, given that it is ideal. Processes 1, 2 and 3, 4 are isentropic and we may write P2 uh, using equation of state between states 1 and 2. We may write P2 as R times P1 times T2 over T1 where R is the compression ratio. And since the process 2, 3 is a constant volume process, we may write P3 as P2 times T3 divided by T2. And in the same manner as what we did for process 1, 2, we may relate uh, P4 and P3 as P4 equal to P3 times T4 over T3 times 1 over R. Okay, so, let us walk through the uh, states in the cycle. So, we start with state 1, uh, temperature is given. So, we go to the uh, table with uh, temperature as 298. So, that is uh, given here and we retrieve the specific internal energy from the table S0 and now in this case we retrieve the value for the uh, relative uh, specific volume that we mentioned earlier Vr, okay. Because this is a non-flow process and uh, compression ratio is defined based on volume, so we retrieve Vr. So, we retrieve 
this, this and this from the table. Now, S at state 1 is the same as S naught because that is at the uh, same pressure, ambient pressure and temperature. Now, 1 to 2 is an isentropic process okay? and we may evaluate uh, P2 using the expression that we uh, wrote down earlier using this one. And uh, remember, um, in our earlier derivation, we uh, mentioned that V2 over V1 in case of an isentropic process is equal to V2 or divided by V1 or. Okay. So, that means that uh, V2 or is 631.9 divided by 9 and that is approximately 70 something approximately 71 let us say. So, we go to the table with this value for V r and then retrieve other quantities of interest. So, V r 70 something. So, let us see where that comes. Okay, So, that is over here. So, that comes between uh, these two entries. So, we uh, interpolate and obtain uh, u. We need not um, uh, get uh, s from the, we need not retrieve s from the table because 1, 2 is an isentropic process. So, we retrieve this value from the table and S2 uh, is equal to S1 because it is an isentropic process. So, next process uh, 2, 3 uh, is uh, heat addition process, constant volume heat addition process. The peak temperature is given. So, we use this value of uh, the temperature to go to the, uh, to go to the table. Let us just quickly see 2200 Kelvin. So, 2200 Kelvin comes here. So, we retrieve u uh, from this table and 0 and v r. So, we retrieve u is 0 and v r from the table using the known value for temperature. And what is that? S yes, uh, has to be calculated from S0 by using the expression that we wrote down earlier. So, S is equal to, uh, I am sorry, S0 of T minus R natural log P over P ref. So, S may be evaluated. 3 to 4 is an isentropic process. So, S4 is equal to S3. And again, we use this fact uh, to uh, calculate V r at state 4, which works out to be approximately 18 or so. So, we can then retrieve this value with this value of V r, uh, we can retrieve this value for u from the air table. So, now uh, we are ready to um, carry out the calculations. So, work supplied during the compression process as we wrote down earlier, specific work supplied during the compression process is u2 minus u1 comes out to be 298 kilojoule per kilogram. Work done during the expansion process is u3 minus u4 comes out to be 1013 kilojoule per kilogram. So, the net work produced per cycle, uh, specific work produced per cycle is 715 kilojoule per kilogram. Heat added per unit mass during each cycle is uh, U3 minus U2 that is 1361 kilojoule per kilogram and heat rejected again this is uh, the, both these are constant volume processes as we mentioned earlier. So, heat rejected during each cycle is 646.31 kilojoule per kilogram. So, the first law efficiency of the cycle is 52.52 percent. The mean effective pressure is defined as W net divided by V1 minus V2. Remember, the uh, if you look at uh, if you look at the um, uh, indicator diagram, then let's see. Let me uh, erase some of these things. The net work produced during the cycle, uh, let me illustrate that here. That is the area inside the cyclic process. So, that comes out to be so 
So, that is equal to this. So, the um, uh, mean effective pressure takes this area, divides it by this volume, this is V1 minus V2, divides it by this volume and uh, gives us a value for pressure. So, it is as if uh, we have uh, uh, a constant pressure and the area under that constant pressure line is equal to the W net. So, this is in many ways or this is in fact, the uh, average uh, you may recall that we calculated the average temperature of heat addition. We calculated the average temperature of uh, heat addition in the Rankine cycle. So, this and uh, this is very very similar to the average temperature of heat addition that we calculated for the Rankine cycle. Okay. So, this is equal to W net over V1 minus V2, which may then be rewritten like this using uh, equation of state and the definition of the compression ratio. And this comes out to be 940 kilopascal. Notice that the peak pressure in the cycle as we calculated here was 6644 kilopascal, whereas the mean effective pressure works out to only about 940 kilopascal. Now, exergy is supplied during the cycle. Notice that exergy is supplied during the <coughs> during the compression stroke and during the heat addition process. Okay. So, exergy is applied during the compression stroke may be evaluated simply by uh, I mean simply I am sorry. Uh, ah, so simply like this. So, this is the uh, exergy, specific exergy. V2 minus V1 and the exergy associated with this heat addition may be evaluated like this. Here we have assumed that Th is the peak temperature in the cycle which is 2200 Kelvin. So, that heat is supplied from a reservoir maintained at uh, 2200 Kelvin. So, the exergy supplied uh, comes out to be like this. Exergy recovered during the cycle is uh, uh, given by this expression. Remember, uh, heat rejection is to the ambient, so no exergy can be recovered during that part of the cycle. The only exergy recovered is when uh, power is produced or, in a, or work is done during the cycle, which we may evaluate like this to be 937.5. And so, the second law efficiency comes out to be 67 percent. Because one uh, interesting aspect about this uh, engine uh, uh, whose picture I showed uh, in the beginning of the lecture is the following. So, we have mentioned that you know compression ratios uh, for spark ignition engines typically tend to be less than 10 and the reason for that is also apparent from this figure. And the next uh, cycle that we are going to discuss is the diesel cycle and as you can judge from this figure, uh, diesel cycles definitely have higher specific power and they also have higher efficiency and their compression ratios are uh, higher than uh, that of the uh, auto cycle. So, this engine that you see here is a very interesting engine because uh, this engine actually operates at uh, compression ratios even greater than 10 but less than that of a diesel engine. So, it typically operates at compression ratios around 11 to 12. So, you may then ask the question how does this engine avoid the uh, issue with knocking. Okay? So, the engine has uh, uh, very very special sensors and other control equipments uh, which uh, measure the equivalence ratio at every instant that during the uh, uh, during the combustion process, in fact, uh, during the entire cycle and then adjust the mixture equivalence ratio, which is the amount of fuel that we are putting in continuously and constantly. So, that the combustion process is always uh, stable. Okay? So, as a result, the efficiency of the cycle is comparable to that of diesel engine, specific power uh, not comparable to diesel engine, but still we actually get over the barrier that we mentioned earlier. Okay? Higher compression ratio definitely gives us higher power. 
ok. And um, <coughs> uh, and the stability issue is addressed through the use of onboard diagnostics and um, direct computer control of the uh, equivalence ratio that is being sent to the engine. This engine also uses additional uh, interesting technologies like or additional interesting strategies like uh, cylinder deactivation during uh, low load operation. So, that uh, when the load is low or when the de power demand is low, not all four cylinders need to generate power. So, couple of cylinders may be shut off. Okay. So, this engine has uh, software and onboard diagnostics which continuously senses the load and then turns off uh, cylinders so that you get higher fuel economy. So, the fuel is not wasted, power is not wasted. So, these are some uh, very revolutionary uh, strategies that have been incorporated in this engine developed by Mazda which illustrates or underscores the fact that there is still a lot of scope for improving efficiencies of existing IC engines. In the next lecture, we will uh, look at uh, the air standard diesel cycle and again uh, do an analysis called air standard analysis and then uh, do a worked example using the air table.